Hello everyone and welcome back to Neuroscience Methods 101. Today we're going to talk about single unit recording. Imagine being a famous rock star or DJ and looking over a concert crowd. You will get a sense of how the crowd behaves without ever being able to focus on a single individual. The same is true when looking at brain activity using non-invasive neuroimaging methods like fMRI, EEG and MEG. They pick up activity that can be attributed to a large pool of neurons. They cannot look at a single neuron. This is only possible when inserting a microscopic electrode into the brain. Given the invasive nature of this procedure, single unit recordings are mostly performed in animal research. However, in some exceptional cases, single cells can be recorded in humans. For example, this can be the case if neurological patients, such as patients suffering from epilepsy or Parkinson disease, get recording electrodes implanted to investigate their disorder. Now, before we go into detail about how single unit recording works, let's define some terms. First of all, we need to make a distinction between intracellular and extracellular recordings. During intracellular recordings, a microelectrode is inserted into the cell body or axon, and the electrochemical signals can be directly recorded. There are a variety of intracellular techniques, but they all damage the cell and are extremely sensitive to distortions. So, they don't lend themselves for research in alive and behaving animals or humans. On the contrary, when we talk about single unit recording, we usually refer to extracellular recordings. In this case, an electrode is placed outside of the cell somewhere in its vicinity. Typically, many microelectrodes are inserted, and at least a good proportion of them will just happen to be near a cell. So how do extracellular recording signals look like? When an action potential propagates from one neuron to the other, the influx of sodium creates a positive charge within the axon. Thereby, the outside of the axon becomes negatively charged. Intracellularly, the action potential therefore creates a characteristic positive deflection, but extracellular recordings show a negative deflection. Thus, extracellular recording signals are flipped, and they are a lot noisier, resulting in a smaller signal. How the exact signal looks like will also depend on where exactly the electrode is located in the extracellular fluid in relation to the cell. Even though single unit placement requires a lot of expertise and precision, it is generally less demanding than intracellular electrode placement. But despite smaller and noisier signals, the major advantage of extracellular single unit recordings is that they are more robust after placement and therefore can be done in the live animals and occasionally in humans. After the data has been recorded, it needs to be analyzed. A single electrode can pick up activity from one cell, no cells at all, or a few cells at the same time. That is why the terminology single unit or single cell recording can be somewhat confusing. Therefore, we need a data processing step called spike sorting, which has as its goal to disentangle signals from different cells. First, spikes are identified by looking at signals that are a number of magnitudes larger than general noise. After having identified all spikes, we can look at the details of how the deflections look like. In other words, the amplitude and the width of the signal. Since the exact shape of the signal depends on where the electrode is placed in reference to the cell, we can distinguish signals from different cells, even if they are picked up by the same electrode. Additionally, the exact shape of the waveform can tell us something about which cell type may have been active. For example, inhibitory and excitatory cells tend to have different spike waveforms. As soon as all the data is analyzed, it can be displayed in so-called raster plots. Here we can see how neural spiking changes as a function of time. This is particularly interesting when a subject is presented with a task or a stimulus, as it allows us to track the related changes in spiking activity. For example, research using single unit recordings in areas related to memory in the human brain have shown that cells are persistently active when keeping in mind a picture during short-term memory. Anyways, that's it! We hope you enjoyed this explanation about single unit recordings. If you did, let us know by giving this video a like. And as always, we hope to see you the next time.